change your mind, change your money, change your life. I am Coach Rob Lee Simmons, the host of this podcast, and let me be your tour guide to greatness. If I was doing any better, I would be you. Welcome to the Greatness Academy podcast. I have my man, one of my leaders, still my leaders and mentors today, uh, William Adams. He is a financial professional, a real financial professional. I call myself a financial professional, but he's a real financial professional. So he has seven years in the advising side and then another 10 in government. So 17 total years. He is a superstar in the financial industry. Welcome to the show, my man. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me. Man, and I appreciate you. I, it's uh, always a great time when I can get my mentors in front of people because uh, I want people to see you know, that piece of me shine through you. And so let me ask you, uh, you know, let's talk a little bit about your journey. So, uh, you know, where are you from? And then how'd you get here today? What does that look like in the, in the last 21 years? We'll say this 21 year old young man. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I guess my barber did a good job. Um, so, yeah, look, originally from England, uh, you know, I guess technically immigrant family, um, maybe not traditionally what you think about as an immigrant family, um, but both my parents were from England. Uh, they lived uh, overseas for a little bit. They came to the U.S. in the mid-70s, and I came with them, so that was good for me. Um, and my dad was was a, a businessman, you know, as a kid, I knew my dad was a businessman. I had no idea what that meant. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just knew he didn't, he didn't do the things that some other people's dads did. Like some people's dads were cops or firefighters. My dad was a businessman. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so maybe that's the genesis of some of my thought process around finance and business was, was him. Uh, he went to work every day, uh, you know, in a suit and tie. Uh, I remember that. Uh, my mom stayed home, uh, raised kids. There were four of us growing up. Um, and once we moved to the U.S., we grew up in South Florida, uh, which was a great place to be. It was warm. It was sunny. Um, it's a nice place to raise kids, I think, for the for the family. Um, I went away to school. Uh, being from England, my parents had an attitude about education where it's very normal to go to boarding school over in England. Um in the U.S., sometimes I get questions, were you bad? They sent you away to school. It has nothing to do with uh, whether I was good or bad, not, and I won't say whether I was one or the other, but <laughs> academically, uh, my parents were very focused on academics. Um, and so I went to uh, Episcopal High School in Alexandria, Virginia, up there on Quaker Lane. Uh, okay, wonderful country. school. Yeah, yeah, fantastic school, 1200 North Quaker Lane. Uh, I remember it well. That was my home for three years, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. And um, and then I did my first year of college over on the eastern shore of Maryland in Chestertown, a place called Washington College, 10th oldest college in the nation, very small college. Um, and I ran out of money after my first year. I had no college money saved. Uh, my parents being... English were pretty conservative about talking about money in a family setting. So I did not know what to expect. So when I went to college, I thought I go to college, they pay, and then that's it. Uh, and we had never discussed what colleges cost. Uh, they certainly never told me how much money they had or what money they had put aside for me. And I'm the youngest of those four kids I was talking about. <laughs> so I am at the uh, the bottom of the food chain when it comes to college money. Right. Um, and the money ran out. Uh, it was a big surprise to me. And at that point, I had already enlisted, but I hadn't done any training yet. But I'd enlisted in the Maryland Army National Guard uh, as an 11 Charlie mortarman in direct fire infantry. Um, in part because the armory was close enough for me to walk to because I didn't have a car. Yeah, yeah. It was a business <laughs> so, decision. <laughs> it was, yeah, I, I was thinking, I was like, all right, logistically, how am I going to work work a job if I don't have a car to get to my job? So nice. I found one that was close. Um, and that led me into something that over time uh, expanded to really become um, the most significant, you know, uh, non-family part of my life. 
which was not a job, but turned into a career and it turned into a lifestyle um, and really shaped me in terms of how I thought about a number of things, whether that was finance. Um, you know, I tell people early on, I can show you my my pay stubs. Uh, I used to make after three years in the army, I made eleven thousand dollars a year. Oh, wow. So. Yeah. So that was in the uh, the early 1990s. I was pulling in a, a strong 11 K a year, <laughs> but, but it paid for everything. I, I lived on base. Um, I didn't have th- a lot of things. I didn't have a lot of recurring bills. I had no cell phone. Uh, very few people did, you know, yeah. uh, there was no internet to pay. I didn't have cable TV. I had rapid ears on the back of the TV and um from a cash flow perspective, I was living on eleven thousand a year, completely happy and oblivious that that was not a lot of money. But to me, it it seemed just fine at the time because it covered all my needs. Um, the part I probably didn't take into account is how many of my needs were being covered in other ways by the U.S. government right. um, through my work. So it, when I decided to leave the army to take a job that paid three times as much. So mid thirties, um, I found myself feeling very broke. Um, all of a sudden I had a house payment and a car payment and different insurances. And they kept taking taxes out of my check that I wasn't used to having been a, a former soldier. Yeah. Um, and at three times the pay, I felt like I had a lot less money, which was an unusual feeling. Um, and it was a great lesson. Um, I, I learned early. I failed early. Uh, I know, you know, if you're a Zuckerberg fan or if you're a programming fan, the concept of, you know, fail fast and failing early, right? Sure. Um, I did. I made a lot of mistakes uh, in my 20s. Um, some of them genuine mistakes. Some of them just poor choices. Um, I chose to take, take a route that was not going to be successful. And, and there was very little indication it was ever going to be successful. Uh, and so I lost money. Uh, I had a hard time. I ended up having to look for a new job. I ended up trying to figure out if I could get two jobs at the same time <laughs> to, to keep my lifestyle the way it was um, when I didn't have a skill set that justified it. And I didn't have uh, the level of education to justify higher salaries. Um, and that led me to change the way I thought about money and um, change what I was willing to spend money on and how I was willing to, to live my life. Um, and it stuck with me. I ended up going back in the army. Um, I ended up having, you know, a wonderful career, which is, is soon to come to a close here. And it has provided a level of security and not just financial security, but really mental security in the knowledge that I had this predictability of cash flow. I had predictability of benefits. Um, and it gave me a mindset where I was able to live within my means, you know, well within my means, acquire true assets, you know, cash producing assets, yeah. um, and stay away from most, not all, <laughs> but most of the liabilities, Yeah, yeah, no, I get it. <laughs> you know, um, so it's been, it's been very good. It's been a, it's been a wonderful ride. And that's sort of the, you know, that's the beginning of my story. We'll see where it goes from here. Yeah, no, that's, that's amazing. Just listening to the experience. Um, and then there sounds like some, um, a lot of mix of trials and tribulations, uh, within that story. So looking at, um, you know, your beginning years, uh, your, your, your parents not really communicating to you. Uh, what the expectation of what money is in a family, uh, how much did that affect you then? And then what what would you say now your outlook on uh, the conversation around money should be with, uh, you know, families and people who live together? What is what is your thought or take on that? So I, I think it was probably one of one of the more impactful things that happened to me as a young man. So I went to even going to boarding school, I was at a boarding school with a lot of young children, you know, young, young adults um, whose parents were pretty well off. And 
I worked two school jobs. Obviously, I was there 24 hours. I lived in the dorm. But I answered the phone uh, for two hours in the evening up, you know, the receptionist desk between 8 p.m. and 10 p.m. when everybody else was in study hall. Uh, I worked in the mailroom <laughs> and sorted mail for 30 minutes every day. Um, and both of these jobs paid $2 an hour. And But at the end of a week, I had enough money where I could hop on the bus, go to King Street Metro Station, you know, go somewhere, catch a movie, even take take out a young lady friend of, of mine if I wanted for, you know, basically a, a burger and a movie, uh, you know, once or twice a month. That's pretty much it. A lot of the other kids had, uh, you know, a, a three series BMW parked across the street at the uh, at the strip mall over there. They used to sneak over there, hop in their car. They already had they had cash flow, but it was from parents. So that was very different for me. And when when there was no more college money, um, and I had never had any expectation of that because of that lack of communication, for whatever reason caused it. Um, I was very disappointed, extremely disappointed. Um, that led me to do things differently. So I have a daughter. Um, my daughter is in a PhD program in Georgia right now. And thanks to my job and also thanks to the communication that she and I always had growing up, she knew what the expectation was academically, but also what the cost of that was. Mm -hmm. So there were choices to be made. Do you want to go to a private school during high school? You know, the, there's this particular one near the base. It's extremely good. And given our roles, we were allowed to look at different schools and pick and choose, you know, because of my job. She wasn't tied into one set high school like a lot of people would be. Right. She made some decisions based on what made her happy. Um, but we always kept that financial discussion going. And when it came time to go to college, she said, Dad, I'm going to go to this school for my undergrad. And I said, well, you got into two other schools that are, you know, on paper, pretty, pretty impressive schools and maybe more recognized as you know having a higher academic standard. And she said, look, this one is 75,000 a year. This other one is 36,000 a year. The one I want to go to is going to cost you effectively nothing. And they're going to take all my AP classes uh, that I did in high school. I said, well, that's good, but Still, I'm willing to invest in your education. Right. And she said, yeah, but dad, I'm going on to a PhD program. The undergrad, not really that important. If I can save the money now and then apply it later when I'm in a PhD program, when I'm really going to need it, that's more important to me. And I said, aha, she gets it. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> so I was really happy about that. Yeah. And you know what? Kids, a lot of kids don't get it. And it does take them time, uh, I think girls are just much better at at getting it um and i think that's amazing so looking at uh you know your life growing up and, and you had this part of your life where you were frugal but you didn't know it and then you had you know you're making three times as much as money as you did but you start to find out that uh america is real and <laughs> we tie everything to everything you do um what would be your suggestion to the listeners of you know how to live a higher quality of life with less things so i mean you, you've almost summed it up in the question itself what caught me out as a young guy was seeing my paycheck seeing the number the gross number three times as high and it made me feel like i i almost needed to spend that extra money. You know, if I'm already, if I know I can live on 11,000 a year, I've been doing that. And then all of a sudden I've got 33, I should be spending. I, you know, it was sort of almost a, a cultural imperative. It's a consumer society, everybody's saying, well, now you can afford this nicer car. Now you can afford the bigger house. Now you can afford, you know, the, these clothes or this watch. Um, and I bought into it, you know, as a, as a, at the time, I was about 25 years old. Um, I definitely bought into it. I immediately went and bought the biggest house that I felt I could afford uh, and a new car and a new wardrobe and, you know, really just loaded up the debt, like 
really, really yeah. quickly. Um, and then felt the pressure of that from there on out. And it was a huge emotional stress. Much later in life, I mean, even to this day, I am in a, a nice house. I like this house. Um, but it's a third of what the bank letter said, you know, when they said, oh, you want a mortgage? Here's the amount we will approve you for. And I immediately thought, that's a ridiculous amount. I, I don't need that. Um, you know, I can get a house for this amount of money and it, it will be more than adequate. And, and it genuinely is. But also with the intent that everything I acquire, especially houses, either needs to pay for itself or it needs to be part of a long term financial plan. It needs to be a, a true asset. And and if you're, a, you know, if you're a rich dad, poor dad guy or somebody like that, you might say, oh, well, a house, you know, not. In some definitions, not an asset. Right. Oh yeah. Sure. <laughs> um, because you're paying money to maintain it the whole time, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. But as you know, I've got a couple other properties now. Um, you know, I hit a point where I decided I will never sell a house again. Um, because you know, if, as Wiley Post said, land they're they're not making any more of it. Right. So I want to hold on to what I have, and I. I'm very fortunate that my career has enabled me to do certain things when it comes to acquiring assets. So I have properties, but those properties pay for themselves and then some, and they build equity over time and they increase my net worth over time. Um, so they become part of that larger financial plan. Yeah. I think uh, during my time of the struggle, because the struggle has always been real, you know, now I have eight kids. And so the struggle is still real, but I, but something clicked, uh, you know, a couple of kids back. And um, that's when I realized, you know, all this energy that I'm, you know, using to make money. Um, I, I, I looked at the aspect of how am I working so hard and the money's still not coming. Then I realized it's actually uh, I'm working backwards because I should have been using uh, my money to make money or other people's time to make money. And when that clicked, that's when I realized well, how to how to properly handle money. When did it click for you that money is important? And how did that transition into uh, your career? So I think there was a probably a fundamental shift in what I was doing when I got my Series 7, my general securities license. Um and then started acting as a financial advisor really before I was, you know, sort of mentally and, and, and based on experience qualified to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a boss back then, God bless him. He used to say, fake it till you make it. Um, but because of my sort of internal fears of doing something wrong, I threw myself into the education part uh, because I really didn't want to make a mistake. And I started seeing what my clients were doing. I started, you know, getting educated through firms that I worked for, where they were pointing out to me, you know, they weren't saying you're making a mistake, but they were saying, here are the mistakes that some people make. And as I looked at them, I was like, oh, that's me. Oh, yeah, yeah some number people. two, that's me. <laughs> number five, that's me. <laughs> And, and I didn't fix them overnight. You know, none of this happens overnight. Um, but with a little bit of time, a little bit of effort, definitely managed to make some corrections in my life at that point. And it, and it, it started with big things. I mean, I like a nice car, uh, as you know. And that's a huge expense. And it's just a depreciating asset. And at the end of the day, it probably doesn't really do that much for you unless you have a genuine reason to have it. Um, but I accept that I have to have a car. I mean, I, you know, I can't get rid of that. Right. But I can make a choice where in that spectrum I'm buying a car. Um, I do. I have to have the hundred thousand dollar car. Could I live with the the sixty thousand, the forty thousand, the twenty five thousand? For me, no. Not gonna have the twenty five thousand. I I know that I'm going to sort of quote unquote waste money by buying a vehicle that that goes when I press the accelerator and it stops when I hit the brake. Right. But I want a little bit more. So I'm, I'm going to be in that middle ground, but I'm not going to go back to 
having a Range Rover again because I, I can't justify that kind of an expense. Um, so it's not perfect. It's not, you know, I'm not universally frugal, but I'm not wasteful either. Um, it's definitely for me a middle ground. And again, it comes down to predictability of cash flow because we live on cash flow more than anything else. Is that I know what my cash flow is. I know that if I have to assume debt, I know what level of debt I can manage and service without it changing my life. And I know what the amortization of that debt will be. And I'm capable of sticking to that. So I can buy a car, have a 36 month note, and be comfortable with that and know exactly how that impacts my life. Um, but again, would I be smarter if I bought the $25,000 car versus the 50? Yeah, I would. Absolutely. Um, and I probably should make more decisions like that. And I do in some things, you know, the big thing like the house. Uh, yeah, I made that kind of a decision. I don't need a million dollar house, uh, even though a lot of my peers have houses that are nicer than mine, you know, and peer yeah. pressure can be. <laughs> yeah. And I would say that, like uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder for sure. Uh, and, and finances are a delicate balance. And, and I think we talked about this before the call. Uh, when you look at your finances, everything isn't one size fits all uh, for everybody because everybody has different circumstances, different experience and different things that sparks their endorphins. So, you know, you have to always take those things into consideration. Um, looking where you are now, um, preparing for retirement. Um, I have some younger viewers as well. Uh, when did you really start? looking at retirement, taking it serious, and what are some of the steps and approaches that you've taken to get to where you are now where you feel like, hey, I can be comfortable in retirement or I can take a job, but I don't have to, or, you know, the situation that you're in now. Well, when did you kind of, when did that kind of click and then what are the steps that you're taking now? So that's a great question. And I think, um, you know, as you said, everything is an individual situation, especially when it comes to personal finance. For me, the, the arc of work leading towards a time when I don't have to work, might choose to, but I don't have to, has changed. So when I was 25, I had one concept of what would happen. When I was 35, it changed again. When I was 45, it changed again. And, and for your, you know, for your, uh, your viewers, my birthday is next month, so I'll be 49 next month. Um, even up until this year, my concept of retirement has still been changing. It's always been in a little bit of flux. Um, and it is very much related to what's going on in my life. So you can swing the pendulum all the way on one side and said, hey, if you won the Powerball, would you retire? Yep, absolutely. Um, but if we look at a more statistically normal set of things, if you work a job that has a fixed pension plan, are you going to use that as the basis for deciding when you want to retire? Or are you going to use happiness as the basis for when you decide to retire? Or family situation is the basis of when you decide to retire. For me, it was a combination of all of those things. I, I love my career. I've had an absolute wonderful time with my career. I feel like you know, I got to a point probably two years ago where I started thinking, am I the am I contributing as much to my career as my career is giving back to me? And I felt like maybe I wasn't. Maybe I wasn't the most competitive person in my career field anymore, um, you know, for a number of reasons. Uh, my family situation was was changing a little bit personally, um, you know, getting married uh, at a later age in life made a change to my family. My mother is a little bit older now. She's in her 80s. I took my current assignment to be within a short drive of her to provide direct support to an older parent. And certainly within the last year, I've realized that I'm probably going to provide a lot more support than I originally planned. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a financial cost to that, of course. Uh, whether, that's, whether that's a true direct financial impact or it's simply an opportunity cost. Hey, I need to be physically close to my aging parent. Therefore, I can't take that job in Washington State because she's in Florida. I need to be close. Or if it's direct, you know, she lives on Social Security. 
a bill is going to happen at some point and she's not going to be able to cover it, of course, I'm going to cover that bill. And I need to sort of mentally and financially prepare for that eventuality that happens. No, that's really good. And I, I mean, I got some good notes, but I think um, the best note that I have is um, what you just said, that retirement really is just an evolving plan. And you just kind of have to look at where you're at um, to see the trajectory of where you're going and then see if, you you know, that time and space matches uh, where you're going. So you, you can always prepare, but it's always better to kind of reevaluate that plan, right? Um, so let me ask you, over your your time of uh, your ups and downs and monies, I'm sure you made some um, interesting purchases. So what are, uh, well, what is the largest purchase you made monetarily? And then how did that make you feel? So... I think this is probably going to be true for a, a lot of Americans, you know, throughout the course of their life. But a home purchase is definitely the largest one. Um, and I have been fortunate to do that a couple of different times. The largest one to date is the one I'm sitting in right now. Um, and it was an interesting feeling because it's not the newest one I own. It's not the biggest one I own. And it was very much influenced by market conditions at the time I bought yeah. it. Um, so, but at the same point, it was a, the, the feeling, the emotion tied to the commitment of present and future earnings um, is significant, right? Sure. I'm going to pay for this 30 year mortgage with my work, with my labor, because I live in this house. Um and I'm going to retire from my current job in a year. So that means there's 29 more years to pay for this house. And it has to come from future earnings. Um, and that was a real sort of, I don't want to say a light bulb moment. I mean, I wasn't oblivious to the fact I was going to do that. Right. But I definitely thought, you know, maybe when I finish this one career, I should go do something else and use all this built up knowledge and experience and apply it either in another organization or maybe even in another field to a monetize it. And if we're being just very crude about it, I want to monetize some of what I've built up. You know, it's kind of the inverse of like a NFL player or an NBA player. They might be at their peak at 18, 19, 20 years old. You know, they might be just stellar. But for most of us, we gain experience and increase our personal value and our work value over time. And at my age, I'm probably at my peak earning potential right now because I have three decades of experience behind me that I can put on a resume, but I haven't hit that age where somebody says, eh, he's, he's a little on the old side. If, if we employ him, how much are we gonna get out of him? If we invest in him as an employer, how much return are we going to get before this person fully retires? Right. And I'm kind of in the sweet spot right now, you know, sort of 45 to 55 is really that, that golden spot uh, for wager. And I made that decision buying this house triggered that decision where I said, yeah, I had thought about just resting. And then I thought, no, that's not sufficient. I, <laughs> I want to earn, you know, I like earning. I'm used to it. I've been doing it for a long time. Uh, and I want to have those future earnings to pay for, for this asset uh, over time. And fortunately, those future earnings will be, you know, sort of inflation adjusted, where the bill for the house is kind of stationary in, in 2023 dollars. Um, so it gets cheaper over time to pay for the house. Yeah. So yeah, that definitely the biggest purchase is the one I'm sitting in right now. <laughs> hey, brother, I would tell you this. Thank you so much for giving us time and uh, definitely providing value. Really appreciate it. I definitely would love to have you back on because, again, we have some pieces in the conversation before this started. We didn't really get to. Um, so that, that means that we we we, we owe the, the viewers a second conversation. I, I thank you for your time, man. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on. And on the show, we say that winners win, and we win when you win, and we want to thank you for being a winner. Cool. <laughs> All right, and we are out. Boom. Thank you for joining the podcast. And remember, change your mind, change your money, 
change your life. We out.